Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here with our program on human microbiome and dysbiosis in clinical disease. This is the video series that accompanies the printed monograph. In that monograph you also have most of the printed presentation slides and you also have password protected access to more than 12 hours of additional video to help you understand and clinically apply this information. What I'm going to do right now is focus on what I consider to be the core highlights of the information. I'll walk you through some case reports so that we can apply that information clinically because of course the emphasis of the program is the translation of basic sciences into clinical practice. You'll find this to be particularly relevant for patients with diabetes, obesity, insulin resistance, and cardiometabolic disease, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, which has recently been renamed systemic exertion intolerance disease, also, I will discuss some neuropsychiatric conditions such as autism and chronic pain and depression. And of course, major emphasis will be placed on the autoimmune and rheumatic diseases such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and multiple sclerosis. This slide provides a listing of the core content, and you might also use this as a mental checklist. We start with a pretest, and that allows us to assess baseline knowledge. It also allows us to assess the overall effectiveness of this learning program. Then we have the printed monograph, and then of course now we are entering into the video series and the video presentations. After we've gone through the pretest, the printed monograph, and the video presentations, then we access the final exam, and that gives you a chance to complete the program and print off your certificate of achievement. So again, taking our focus back to the video presentations, we're starting right now with number one, which is pathophysiologic mechanisms. I'll also talk about microbes, molecules, and morphology. This slide provides you kind of a general outline of the presentations. Each one, of course, will have its own title and introduction. I'll go through a few necessary repetitions, such as notices, disclosures, definitions, and goals. Then we'll dive into the core coursework. That will include at least one contextualizing case. And then towards the end, I'll provide a summary review and we'll conclude each video. Generally, as many of you know, I try to present my information in kind of a conversational style. What I found with this new information on microbiome and dysbiosis is that it is so detailed and so intricate that if I deliver it in a conversational style, it will double the amount of time necessary to get through this material. So what I'm going to do instead is focus on just what I consider the most important highlights, recalling that you've got the printed monograph that provides a lot of the more intimate and intricate details. You also have, with that monograph, access to 12 hours of additional video. And you can, of course, with this video format, always pause, replay, and review the material anytime so that you can learn this material not simply at your own pace, but also to your particular level of expertise that you'd like to gain. So, for example, if you just want to go through the program, become familiar with the material, print off your certificate of achievement, you can certainly do that. However, if you want to review the material more than once, you can do that as well, and that allows you to define and actualize your particular desired level of expertise with this material. I think you'll find this to be a very efficient delivery system, and again, that allows you to use your time for other purposes or to gain additional mastery over the material. A few notices and disclosures listed here. All of this material is, of course, copyrighted. I publish this in my books, and some of the material is also protected by trademark. The scope of delivery of this information is intended for licensed healthcare providers. This is not individualized healthcare advice, and the doses that I list are for adults unless specified otherwise. Again here, overviewing the core material of the program, we've got the printed monograph, we have the graphics and presentation slides that are printed in the book. Now we're starting the video series, and then we also have the pretest and the post-test. And I want to encourage you to look at the pretest and post-test, not simply as a hoop that you have to jump through, but as a chance to really understand and interact with the material at a deeper level. Additional notices and disclosures are provided here. I have worked as a consultant researcher and lecturer for Biotics Research Corporation. Some of the treatment recommendations that I mentioned may be considered to be off-label or unapproved by the FDA. All of the content has been validated and sourced from peer-reviewed research. And of course, we follow some ethical guidelines in the formation of these materials, and you'll see the core ethical guidelines listed at the bottom of this slide. Again, the intended audience for this material includes health science students and doctorate level licensed clinicians. As we go through the material, I may reference an occasional magazine or newspaper article, but again, the core material is always sourced back 
to peer-reviewed medical research. We're all encouraged to practice evidence-based medicine these days, so I want to review what the four pillars are of evidence-based medicine, and those are patients' preference and autonomy, clinicians' expertise and experience, scientific research, and the socioeconomic and clinical conditions in which we find ourselves applying this information to patients. The primary goal of this work is, of course, clinical action and clinical application. When I first started publishing and presenting on this material about 10 years ago, microbiome was not even a word in common parlance. These days we see that word used not only in the peer-reviewed research, but also in an increasing number of articles intended for the general public. So whether we are clinicians or the general public, this is a conversation that everyone's having these days. Everybody's talking about dysbiosis and microbiome. However, one of the things I've noticed is that beyond several commonly repeated concepts, I don't see this information really being translated in detail into clinical practice. And that was part of what encouraged me to go ahead and update and restructure my own information so that we could really make this very important information on the microbiome and the role that microbes have in health and disease actionable and applicable to our daily lives and to our clinical practices. For example, microbiome is a very important concept, but doctors cannot treat and correct concepts. The concept has to be deciphered into actionable assessments and interventions for it to have clinical value. As I state again here more briefly and perhaps more clearly, you can't do anything with the microbiome because you can't treat concepts. And microbiome is kind of a conceptual structure, we might say. We have to break that down and decipher it into things we can actually manage and apply clinically. Only when the concept is deciphered into a manageable set of the most important components can you then actually work with it. The goal is not to convert clinicians into immunologists, microbiologists, or inflammologists, but rather to define specific concepts and to describe consistent themes so that clinicians will be empowered to assess patients more accurately and treat them more effectively. So let's get into that structure and then into the material. What I think is needed here in order to understand and master the microbiome or anything complex for that matter is a structured approach, one that is well grounded and comprehensive based on pattern recognition, but also flexible and amenable to expansion in the future when we have additional information. I actually learned this concept from reading philosophy and in particular the work of Frederick Nietzsche in his compilation of notes entitled Will to Power, which was published a year after his death, he wrote, in order for a particular species to maintain itself and increase its power, its conception of reality must comprehend enough of the calculable and constant for it to base a scheme of behavior on it. So as we progress through this introduction, I'll show you the intellectual structure that I've developed for what I call the functional inflammology protocol. The second component in that protocol is addressing the microbiome and dysbiosis. On this slide, I show you an example of two articles that are available online, which I published back in 2006. And again, as I said before, the concept of dysbiosis is valuable in itself and research on the microbiome is important. But these concepts lose their value if they cannot be translated into practical and actionable understanding. Clinicians cannot treat concepts. So again, what I'm trying to do is take my 20 years of study of this material and really give you the gems, the pearls, the highlights, and the structure so that you can apply that with clinical effectiveness. Moving on now into the actual core material, we're gonna start with some definitions and terminology. Microbiota refers to the actual individual microbes, whereas microbiome is slightly more specific in talking about the DNA or the genome of those microbes. A popular estimate that I'm sure you've read is that the human body contains more than 10 times the number of microbial cells than of human cells, and that the entire microbiome accounts for about 1 to 3% of total body mass. That comes out to about 3 pounds, or approximately 1.5 kilograms. The majority of microbes cannot be cultured. That's why we see increasing use of various uh, technologies, such as DNA-based testing. Symbionts are the bacteria that live in or on us and either have no effect or have a slightly beneficial effect. Pathobionts are bacteria that live in or on us and are particularly predisposed to become pathogenic in states of injury, mucosal breach, or immune suppression, for example. 
probiotics are the good bacteria that we can consume orally in foods or in pills and powders in the form of nutritional supplements, and these have beneficial effects. Prebiotics are the food that actually fuels the growth of the probiotics. So prebiotics, again, are a food source for the probiotic or good bacteria, and when we combine probiotics with prebiotics, we call those products synbiotics. Dysbiosis is commonly defined as an alteration in microbial patterns, which is kind of a quantitative or numerical description, and I disagree with that definition, and I'll show you my own definition. I think the definition of dysbiosis needs to consider not simply the microbial balance, but also the host response to that microbial balance, and again, I'll walk you through my definition on the following slide. Some of the terms that we use from immunology include antigenic, which is a contraction for antibody generating, and immunogenic, which is a much broader term, and that of course means immune response generating. Now I want to show you my definition of dysbiosis, and I want to help you expand your conception of dysbiosis as we talk about the microbiome in clinical practice. My definition of dysbiosis has been for many years that dysbiosis is a relationship of non-acute, non-infectious host microorganism interaction that adversely affects the human host. Typically with dysbiosis, we of course do not see the classic signs of acute infection, such as fever, redness, or swelling. And usually the location of active dysbiosis has no signs or manifestations, or such findings are nonspecific. For example, many patients with GI dysbiosis, even severe pathogenic GI dysbiosis, have no major clinical GI symptoms, just as patients with sinorespiratory or genitourinary dysbiosis do not present with manifestations of an upper respiratory tract infection or a urogenital tract infection. On this slide, I'd like to review with you some very important learning objectives, and these include understanding the role that the total microbial load plays in the genesis and perpetuation of what we used to call chronic inflammatory diseases, and which I'm going to encourage you to call sustained inflammatory responses. You know, of course, that when we use the term chronic inflammatory diseases, we're kind of resigning ourselves to the belief that the disease itself has a life of its own, and it's going to be chronic. Whereas if we redefine it slightly, and instead of saying chronic inflammatory disease, we say sustained inflammatory response, then I think that gives us a chance to really engage with the disease process in a more active manner to understand and decipher and then address what are the factors that are sustaining this patient's inflammatory response. When we engage more actively with the material, I think that actually gives us a chance to engage more successfully in our clinical practices. We also, of course, want to be able to define dysbiosis beyond its microbial definition. And I think that when we do that, we'll end up with three core components that we can use in our anti-dysbiosis protocol. First of all, of course, we can always address the microbes. We can always just kill them off. I think that's a very simple and ultimately simple-minded approach, even though sometimes it's very effective. And sometimes that is the, the required and desired approach. But let's look beyond that. Let's look at other things that we can do as well. For example, if a patient has an inflammatory response to a group of microbes, or we could say their, their total microbial balance, what that implies is that their immune system is not able to adequately control or kill off those offending microbes, right? So typically what we see in patients who have this dysbiotic inflammation is that they have some level of immune suppression. Otherwise, they'd either be controlling or killing off their offending microbes. So with an expanded appreciation of what is dysbiosis, and when we see dysbiosis as a relationship between the microbes and the host, one of the interventions then that we can use is to restore immune function or to optimize immune function so that the immune system does its job of either killing off or controlling these microbial populations. A lot of times what we see in patients who have sustained inflammation as a result of microbial imbalance is that they quantitatively have more bacteria on their skin, for example, and in their gastrointestinal tract. So a very reasonable question becomes, well, why do they have more bacteria? And I propose to you here that it reflects a state of subclinical immune suppression, and we can do things such as stress management, nutritional supplementation, to optimize their immune function. Another question that we can ask is that if these patients have a subtle microbial balance that's promoting the development and perpetuation of inflammatory disease, 
why isn't their immune system tolerating that microbial imbalance that another patient may tolerate without any problem? So beyond looking at the microbes, we want to look at the immune system. We want to look at why is the immune system not doing its job of controlling or killing off these offensive microbial populations. And we also want to ask the question, why isn't the immune system tolerating these benign bacteria? A lot of the bacteria that trigger inflammatory diseases are not pathogenic bacteria. They are benign bacteria. So a question that we should ask is why is the immune system in this particular patient so intolerant of a benign microbial stimuli? So again, the main three components of my overall antidysbiosis protocol include antimicrobial interventions, immunorestorative interventions, and also immunotolerogenic interventions. On this slide, I'll provide you more terminology and a little bit of the history of the development of my program. We first started talking about dysbiosis, as I mentioned before, many years ago. In approximately 2006, I published an article in a textbook called Integrative Rheumatology, wherein I discussed, I believe for the first time, the concept of multifocal polydysbiosis. Typically, for example, in the middle of the 1990s, when we talked about dysbiosis, we pretty much exclusively focused on gastrointestinal dysbiosis. Now, as you can see here, we appreciate several different location-specific subtypes of dysbiosis, and those, of course, include gastrointestinal dysbiosis, now orodental dysbiosis, sinorespiratory dysbiosis, parenchymal dysbiosis, genitourinary dysbiosis, and also cutaneous and environmental dysbiosis. In the bottom left of this slide, I've listed some problematic GI microbes that I've seen in my own clinical practice. These include Aeromonas hydrophila, Blastocystis hominis, Candida albicans, and other yeast, Citrobacter rhododendron, which is another name for Citrobacter frundii, Diantamoeba fragilis, Endolimax nana, Entamoeba histolytica, Gamma strep, Enterococcus, Giardia lamblia, Hafnia alvei, Helicobacter pylori, Klebsiella pneumoniae, and Proteus mirabilis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staphylococcus aureus, and Staphylococcus epidermidis, Streptococcus pyogenes, and other group A streptococci. In the second video in this series, I'll review with you the molecular mechanisms of physiologic and pathophysiologic responses. On the following slide, I'll show you a graphic representation of this material and the overall model. Again, we start with the dysbiotic locations, and those include orodental, sinorespiratory, gastrointestinal, genitourinary, and dermal, and then tissue, which includes bacteria and viruses. And then we can talk about environmental exposure to microbial components. I call that environmental dysbiosis. We can also consider microbial dysbiosis to represent microbial infections of other microbes, one relevant example being the infection by viruses of bacteria. So for example, bacteriophages are viruses that only infect bacteria, and we're seeing in the current research literature some conversation about alterations in the virome of bacteriophages that are associated with certain diseases such as lupus and inflammatory bowel disease. So from the summation of all of those locations, the body has to deal with and the immune system has to respond to all of these major microbial molecules. And I consider the major microbial molecules to be exotoxin, tachoic acid, endotoxin, or LPS, that stands for lipopolysaccharide that comes from gram-negative bacteria. We also have to consider the impact of viral DNA, as I already mentioned, for example, from endogenous viruses, exogenous viruses, and bacteriophages. We also have to consider the load of bacterial DNA, their anti-metabolites and other enzyme-derived metabolic processes and antigens and also the other, for example, fungal elements and superantigens, all of which I call the total microbial load, which then contributes to the total inflammatory load. As a result of the body's response to that total inflammatory load, we either get physiologic responses or pathophysiologic responses, and I've outlined those for you here, and we'll just start again left to right. These can include mitochondrial dysfunction and, in particular, a subtype of mitochondrial dysfunction called mitochondrial hyperpolarization. Along with that, we see mTOR activation. We can also talk about central sensitization as a result of microbial exposure, 
bystander activation. We can also talk about haptonization. Haptonization is the combination of a microbial molecule with a human molecule. And when we combine a microbial molecule with a human molecule, of course, that creates a new antigen or a new immunogen, and that's called haptonization or neoantigen formation. A new antigen is formed in that process. We'll also talk about inhibited detoxification and immune impairment as a result of microbial exposure. And we can also talk about the enhanced presentation of autoantigens along with bystander activation. So as a result of all of those factors interacting with the patient's unique genomic and nutritional and hormonal profile, we end up seeing certain patterns of disease, certain patterns of inflammation, and that's what we appreciate clinically. And I've divided those into certain specific clinical prototypes. These include dysbiotic encephalopathy, central sensitization to pain, fatigue, and depression. A good example of that is fibromyalgia. Also immune complex arthritis, dermatitis, and vasculitis. And of course, one of the prototypes that we're all familiar with, and that is reactive arthritis and its autoimmune variants, such as ankylosing spondylitis and rheumatoid arthritis. On this slide, I want to reinforce the concept of the total microbial load, and I'm going to talk specifically about the total viral load. The total microbial load includes bacteria, yeast, viruses, bacteriophages, and endogenous viruses. When we talk about viruses, we have to talk about the number and quantity of those viruses, the region or specific tissues or location of those viral infections, and the level of activation recalling that viruses are not active and cannot reproduce on their own, what's required is an interaction between the virus and the human host, and that's what determines the level of viral activation. And another important concept here is that of viral transactivation. Because some of the molecular mechanisms are similar among different viruses for their replicative process, the activation of one virus tends to promote the activation of other viruses, and again, that's called viral transactivation. Now let's look at the model I've presented for you here. Again, talking about the total viral load in this example. That includes exogenous viruses, endogenous viruses, and bacteriophages. One of my favorite ways of describing dysbiosis and dysbiotic inflammation is to say that often what we find when working with autoimmune and inflammatory patients is that they are having a pathogenic inflammatory response to a non-pathogenic microbe. And these days we would extend from non-pathogenic microbe to a non-pathogenic pattern of microbial either balance or imbalance. But again, what we see is an exaggerated immune response against benign bacteria in a lot of these inflammatory and autoimmune conditions. These very specifically include ANCA vasculitis, formerly called Wergener's granulomatosis, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, dermatomyositis and polymyositis, Sjogren's syndrome, psoriasis, lupus, and we also can consider, again, certain clinical prototypes such as reactive arthritis and short bowel syndrome, also called bowel-associated dermatitis arthritis syndrome. I mentioned just a moment ago the activation of mTOR by bacterial debris, and you can see that modeled for you right here, where I talk about bacterial endotoxin or bacterial LPS interacting with a receptor called toll-like receptor number four, when bacterial endotoxin activates toll-like receptor number four, of course that triggers an inflammatory response, mostly mediated through NF-kappa B, but it also triggers an alteration in mitochondrial function called mitochondrial hyperpolarization. That predisposes towards sustained activation of mTOR, and as I'll show you later, we're gonna look at mTOR activation as a primary driver of autoimmunity and sustained inflammation. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with my work on mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial nutrition. One of the major influences on mitochondrial function is the microbial and dysbiotic balance that can trigger mitochondrial dysfunction, and I'll show you a few examples of that within this first presentation in the video series. When microbes and dysbiosis contribute to mitochondrial dysfunction, then of course that contributes to the overall clinical picture and the pathophysiology and the vicious cycles that again contribute to, sustain, and exacerbate mitochondrial dysfunction.
Here I'll show you a separate model, which is also somewhat related back to mitochondrial dysfunction, and that is the model of endoplasmic reticulum stress and the related unfolded protein response. So a variety of metabolic insults, such as hyperglycemia, and microbial insults from viruses and bacteria, and xenobiotic insults from drugs or corporate pollution, all of these can act to trigger endoplasmic reticulum stress and then endoplasmic reticulum stress triggers the unfolded protein response, which is a very nonspecific pro-inflammatory response. And this contributes to some of the disorders that we see in clinical practice, again, including mitochondrial dysfunction, low-grade sustained inflammation, oxidative stress, a pro-inflammatory response, insulin resistance, hyperphagia, and non-satiation. So this relates back to patients who, for example, have difficulty with dietary compliance. Part of the reason they have difficulty with dietary compliance is that they don't receive the same satiation signals that the rest of us might receive from consuming food, and as a result of that, they're always hungry. This relates back to something that we'll talk about in future presentations, and that is the concept of hypothalamic inflammation, which is partly triggered by microbial and metabolic insults, and also, again, from corporate pollution. Independent from this pathway that involves endoplasmic reticulum stress and the unfolded protein response, of course, other pathways can also get activated to contribute to the clinical presentation of these various disease phenotypes. So that was the quick overview and introduction to the clinical application of the functional inflammology protocol, which I find to be very effective for the correction of metabolic inflammation, allergic inflammation, and autoimmune inflammation. I consider those to be the three types of inflammation that we see in clinical practice, again, metabolic, allergic, and autoimmune. So let's go a bit farther now and look at the overall intellectual structure, as I call it, of the functional inflammology protocol. The entire protocol, of course, is detailed in some of my larger books, but let's look at the structure, and I'll show you how to basically do what's commonly termed plug and play with this structure. So here on the left-hand side of your screen, you can see a representation of the overall structure. And I want you to think of this structure metaphorically as representing a bookcase or a library, for example. And once we have the basic structure and we've memorized the basic structure for clinical application, then we can plug and play as needed and we can tailor different protocols to the individual needs of our patients. So for example, in some patients, we really have to focus on their food and nutrition. In other patients, we give more attention to infections and dysbiosis. In other patients, we might give more attention to balancing their immune phenotype, that is providing more balance to the ratio of T regulatory cells to TH17 cells. For example, we often need to enhance the T regulatory cells at the expense of the TH17 cells. In some patients, we need to focus on their mitochondrial performance, and we can implement certain protocols that are very specific and very effective for optimizing mitochondrial health. In some patients, we need to focus more on their lifestyle, and that includes sleep optimization and stress management, also getting them to exercise. In this case, I use sweat as a metaphor for exercise. In a lot of patients, we have to look at balancing their hormones, because a lot of hormones can either have a pro-inflammatory effect or an anti-inflammatory effect. So we need to assess their hormones and optimize those balances and those ratios in order to optimize their immune and inflammatory balance. And finally, of course, we're all exposed to xenobiotics due to lack of government regulation and corporate irresponsibility. Those xenobiotics or persistent organic pollutants have an effect on our immune system just like they have an effect on our mitochondria. And you can see direct correlations between metabolic illness, mitochondrial dysfunction, and the total xenobiotic load, or the total load of persistent organic pollutants. Again, as I mentioned before, the dysbiosis component that we're talking about now is only one component of the overall seven-part protocol. I think you'll find that once you learn this material and have studied it sufficiently for clinical application, that this actually saves you a lot of time and improves your clinical success. And finally, one of the things I've considered recently is the way that this occurs to me is that articles and classes provide information, whereas books and extended courses actually have the opportunity to provide more than simply information. They provide systems of thought and intellectual structure. And again, I'm trying to contextualize our microbiome information within an overall structure. And again, you can see that represented here. So for example, in clinical practice, we often deal with chronic, sustained, low-grade inflammation. 
In the medical model or in medical school and our medical training, what we focus on is the pharmacologic suppression of that inflammation because we're trying to suppress these clinical manifestations, whether it's pain or fatigue or long-term depression. So for example, in the naturopathic and functional medicine model, what we do is focus on what are the upstream contributors to that low-grade inflammation, and we often find that to be mitochondrial impairment and metabolic dysfunction, a pro-inflammatory diet and lifestyle, multifocal dysbiosis that I mentioned previously, and which obviously is the focus of this course, psycho-emotional and physical stressors, xenobiotic immunotoxicity, immunophenotype imbalance, and again, hormone or endocrine imbalances. Those all contribute in concert to immune activation, which drives a lot of the clinical pathology that we deal with in our practices, whether it's obesity and insulin resistance or cardiometabolic disease, or allergy, asthma, eczema, atopic dermatitis, or the more severe inflammatory syndromes, which we call autoimmunity, rheumatoid arthritis, and lupus being two of the prototypes. Again here, another graphic representation walking you through the FIND SEX acronym. Now, of course, you don't necessarily want to or have to write F-I-N-D-S-E-X in your chart note. You could write F-I-N-D-S-E-T, exchanging the X for xenobiotics. You could use toxins as a T instead, and you could say FIND SET, as if you're finding a set of problems and solutions. F-I-N-D-S-E-X or F-I-N-D-S-E-T stands for food, infection, nutritional immunomodulation, dysmetabolism or dysfunctional mitochondria, style of living, stress modification, sleep optimization, endocrine or hormonal imbalances, and again, xenobiotics or toxins. We need to consider all of those when we're dealing with today's chronic and sustained inflammatory disorders. I think that most of us are familiar with the traditional SOAP note, which stands for Subjective Objective Assessment and Plan. This is a way of approaching patients, integrating their subjective information from their history with objective findings, such as physical exam and laboratory and imaging findings. We combine those two components together to come up with an assessment, and on that assessment, we base our plan. So you can think of the functional inflammology protocol as a way of extending this in an organized manner so that you can apply this information clinically. Because now we know that we need to focus on food and lifestyle, infections and microbial imbalances. We can certainly intervene at the level of the immune system and promote balance. I call that nutritional immunomodulation. And the goal of that particular sub-protocol is to optimize the balance between T regulatory cells and Th17 cells. We can affect dysmetabolism and dysfunctional mitochondria through specific nutritional interventions. Items in the fifth component all start with S, or at least the S sound, so that includes stress, sociology, psychology, and style of living or lifestyle, and of course that includes sleep optimization as well, because we appreciate that when people are sleep deprived, they are in a pro-inflammatory state and they are simultaneously immune suppressed. Number six, we look at hormone and endocrine imbalances. Then, of course, we need to consider the role of toxins and xenobiotics on inflammatory responses and metabolic performance because we know that a lot of these toxins promote the low-grade inflammation that contributes to insulin resistance, which drives obesity and diabetes. And we also know that these toxins directly contribute to mitochondrial impairment, which is also known to promote obesity, insulin resistance, and neurodegeneration. So again, we're going to focus right now on part number two, infections, microbial imbalances, and dysbiosis. So now that I've given you an overview of the protocol and an introduction to the way that this information can be applied clinically, let's dive into the details of dysbiosis and microbial imbalances, and let's talk about the actual mechanisms through which these translate into clinical disease. So right now we're going to start, again, this is video number one, and we're going to discuss microbial molecules, mechanisms, and morphology. Our contextualizing case for this first section is actually outlined here, and you can see that this is a 24-year-old patient who presents with mild cognitive impairment or brain fog, new and progressive multiple chemical sensitivities or environmental intolerance, new immediate onset food allergies manifested by oral and mucosal blistering, a progressive relative leukopenia, and a positive clinical response to a vitamin B12 injection.
So based on this clinical presentation, we did a comprehensive stool analysis, as you can see represented here. These are the microbial culture results. And what I'd like for you to be able to do by the end of this presentation is interpret these stool analysis results with the patient's clinical presentation. Again, feel free at any time to pause the video if you want more time to analyze the case and some of these laboratory details. Let's talk now about bacterial morphology and the clinical relevance. I'm sure we're all familiar with gram staining as a way to differentiate gram positive from gram negative bacteria. This is part of what helps us determine antibiotic selection. We note that gram positive bacteria produce lipotechoic acid or tachoic acid, whereas gram negative bacteria produce endotoxin, also known as lipopolysaccharide, abbreviated LPS. Both gram negative and gram positive bacteria can produce peptidoglycan. Gram positive bacteria produce more peptidoglycan, so a lot of times when we talk about peptidoglycan, we want to think in particular about gram positive bacteria. But actually, again, peptidoglycan is produced by both gram negative and gram positive bacterial strains. So those are the two major categories of bacteria, generally speaking. We think of gram negatives and gram positives. A lot of times we're not taught about cell wall deficient bacteria, and we'll talk about those in one of the upcoming sections. So again, common to both gram negative and gram positive bacteria are flagellum, pilus, bacterial capsule, bacterial cell wall, which is directly inflammatory and can promote the development of inflammatory arthritis, also peptidoglycan, and you see here, of course, the bacterial cytoplasmic membrane. Unique to gram-positive bacteria is lipotechoic acid or tachoic acid, and unique to gram-negative bacteria is bacterial endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide. The clinical consequence of endotoxin is what I'm going to focus on for the next few slides, and these include inflammation, increased intestinal permeability, impairment of the cytochrome P450 detoxification system, impairment of mitochondrial performance, and pain sensitization via peripheral and central mechanisms. Let's use this article to exemplify and underscore the clinical relevance of bacterial endotoxin. The title of this article, as you can see, is Human Experimental Endotoxemia in Modeling Pathophysiology, Genomics, and Therapeutics of Innate Immunity in Complex Cardiometabolic Diseases. This was published in Arteriosclerosis, Thrombosis, and Vascular Biology in 2015. Let's look at two excerpts from this article. Increasing evidence suggests that the infectious biome-related or endogenous activation of the innate immune system may contribute to the development Now we have arrived at the end of this presentation, so let's all take a deep breath, congratulate ourselves. We just talked about the microbial mechanisms, molecules, and morphology. We're now going to move on to the next video in the series, and we're going to focus on pathophysiologic responses triggered by these microbial exposures, and that will help us transition from microbes through pathophysiology and ultimately to clinical prototypes and more ways that we can manage the microbiome and dysbiotic responses in clinical practice. So I look forward to presenting that information on pathophysiologic responses that serve as the interface between the microbe and the clinical outcomes that we see in our practices. Mm -hmm.